Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Finish it up, boys. Genghis Khan, Beginnings of the Great Mongol Nation, Part 5. I'd recommend watching the previous episodes, but that is up to you. Original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord. If you are not ready to learn, there is the door. You are in the wrong class, my friend. Home act is down the hall. Make me a cheesy pita with... Let's go. After defeating... We'll just sit and chill, that's fine. One year after defeating his greatest rival, Temujin Khan summoned the greatest and most important Kurultai in Mongolian history. Okay. After many days of ceremony and ritual, and many nights of celebration, Temujin is elected Khan of all Mongols, and chooses a new title for himself, Genghis Khan. At the age of 45, Genghis Khan controlled a vast territory and over one million souls. His domain stretched from the Gobi Desert in the south to the Arctic Tundra in the north, from the Manchurian forests in the east to the Altai Mountains to the west. He named his new people the Great Mongol- Is it just me or do I feel like this is kind of fast-forwarded a bit? A young woman gives- I know, one, two, three, four, we did. No, okay. Alright, okay nation. He abolished inherited aristocratic titles, criminalized the abduction or enslavement of any Mongol, forbade the selling and kidnapping of women, declared all children born of Mongol parents to be legitimate, and made livestock theft punishable by death. He ordered the adoption of a writing system, conducted a census, and instituted diplomatic immunity and freedom of religion, exempting all religious leaders and their property from taxation and public service. Eventually, he extended this tax exemption to anybody who provided essential public services, including undertakers, doctors, lawyers, teachers, and scholars. With the nomadic tribes united and Genghis Khan established as their leader, his next step wasn't clear. He had spent so many years locked in conflict with Jamaka and Ong Khan that now his enormous tribe lacked a mission. His next step? Is that, is that a pun? No. Because... The central steps, never mind. In conflict with Jamaka and Ong Khan that now his enormous tribe lacked a mission. So he turned his gaze beyond the steppe and engaged in a series of raids against the Tangut Empire in what is now Western China. Unlike the nomadic steppe tribes, the Tangut had walled cities, moats, and fortresses. Their armies were nearly twice the size of Genghis Khan's. In these campaigns, he had to adopt new methods of warfare to adapt to these conditions. He quickly learned classic siege techniques such as cutting off his enemy's food supply, but soon began experimenting with new tactics. On one raid, he attempted to divert a nearby river to flood the city. Despite scant experience in engineering, the Mongols did succeed in diverting the river, but they wiped out their own camp instead of the Tangut. They ah. survived their mistake, though, and went on to conquer the city. And with every siege, the Mongols would learn, and eventually become experts at devastating enemy cities. Until this point, not many people outside of Mongolia had taken much notice of the upstart barbarian chief, or his newly proclaimed nation. This was about to change. In 1210, when Genghis Khan was 48, the Jurchid nation sent a delegation from their capital city of Zhengdu, where modern-day Beijing now lies. Ong Khan had previously sworn allegiance to them, so now they came to demand the submission of Genghis Khan. Upon hearing this order, Genghis Khan turned in the direction of their nation to the south, spat on the ground, unleashed a line of insults, and then mounted his horse and rode north, leaving the stunned envoy choking in his dust. The Mongol army advanced to the south, sending squads of soldiers ahead to scout for decent pasture, seek out water sources, and report on weather conditions. Their previous raids in the Tangut Empire turned out to be a perfect practice for their campaign against their Jurchid neighbors. Desert crossings and siege warfare were now solved problems. And the Mongols had another surprising advantage. Their diet. Traditional armies traveled in long columns with massive supply trains. The Mongols, in contrast, spread out over a vast area to provide sufficient pasture for their animals, and each warrior hunted for himself or carried his own individual supplies. Though dispersed, the Mongols' strict decimal organization system was diligently enforced, such that each unit, with its own doctors and commanders, always knew where to report and how to find what they needed. 
And because most of the Mongol army was illiterate, and communication across such a large area was critical, the officers came up with a novel solution. Orders were composed in rhyme, to ensure that messages were easily memorized and repeated to each new person exactly as they were originally spoken. The Mongols also launched propaganda campaigns to break the spirit of the Jurchid people, claiming that the Mongols were coming as a liberating force to free them from the oppressive royal family. More than a few Jurchid defected to join him. In the end, they found victory by transforming the Jurchid's greatest asset, their large population, into a weakness. They terrorized the countryside and conscripted local peasants, clearing out all the surrounding villages before turning their sights to the larger cities, using peasants as human shields. Rounding up an enemy's herds and stampeding them toward their owner's battle lines was a traditional steppe tactic, but the Mongols modified this old classic by using enemy peasants instead, attacking and burning undefended villages and sending terrified peasants fleeing in all directions, clogging highways and making it difficult for the Jurchid supply caravans to move. Over the course of... Interesting, because that could be terrifying one and all these people saying oh my god they're coming they're coming and running through and obviously blocking up the uh the ability to to actually could that have never mind i was gonna say it would impede the armies but that would say that they were all really close together and all the peasants were like funneling and i had an idea and i it failed never mind highways and making it difficult for the Jurchid supply caravans to move. Over the course of the campaign, more than one million refugees fled the countryside and poured into the cities, causing chaos and food shortages. The Jurchid military ended up executing tens of thousands of their own people just to maintain enough food stores to feed their armies. Whoa. During this campaign, Genghis Khan discovered that Chinese engineers had developed powerful machines to batter city walls from afar. To adapt these massive war machines to fit his mobile army, he began hosting a corps of engineers on every campaign, who would camp in the forests close to target cities and cut down enough wood to build siege engines on the spot. In 1214, despite some difficulties adapting to the hot, damp climate, Genghis Khan finally besieged the capital city of Chengdu. The Jurchid had endured so much strife by then that they quickly agreed to a settlement, rather than face a prolonged siege. In return for Mongol withdrawal, the Jurchid leader, known as the Golden Khan, swore allegiance to Genghis Khan, and offered massive amounts of silk, silver, gold, horses, and people. As soon as the Mongols left, however, the Golden Khan and his entire royal... I know you guys explained why. Uh, I, I, I've gotten answers to this. as to Because I, I found it so odd that every... Cult, like, so many cultures around the world that there's no way every one of them could have communicated like from the Incas to the Europeans to uh you know northern Africans to Middle East to, uh South Asia East Asia everyone sees gold as this amazing metal and you guys have explained that it has a lot of special qualities that make it so you know it's not just the look of it and, and so I got it but before that that was odd to me how like everyone just happened to agree that this metal was just like the best most, um, luxurious one, I guess. As soon as the Mongols left, however, the Golden Khan and his entire royal court fled, hoping to get far enough away to escape the reach of the Mongol army. Genghis Khan saw this as a breach of their agreement and returned to sack the capital. This time, Genghis Khan offered no opportunity to negotiate. They looted the city according to the new Mongol law. They took absolutely everything, inventoried it, and distributed it amongst the army. As a final punishment, as the Mongol warriors retreated to their homeland, they churned up the earth behind them and trampled it with their horses. Genghis Khan wanted to ensure that the peasants never returned to their fields. Besides, this way he could convert the land to open pasture, both to feed his newly captured livestock and to allow easier access in future campaigns in the region. He's like a snowball. Or a, a rolling, you know how, like, the rolling snowball? And it's just, like, the, every place he conquers, he just, like, becomes bigger and bigger and bigger in, in both horses and livestock and food and pasture and uh, men, manpower.
But in the years that Genghis Khan had been raiding abroad, trouble had begun to brew at home. Hmm? Some of his most steadfast followers, the Muslim Uyghurs of the desert oases, supported him so strongly that other Uyghurs living further to the west, in modern-day Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, wished to overthrow their Buddhist rulers and join Genghis Khan as well. Some sent envoys to Mongol lands seeking an alliance, but others were under the control of Kuchlug, the son of the Naiman Khan who had harbored Jamaka. In his new position of power, Kuchluk began to persecute his Muslim subjects, forbidding the call to prayer, public worship, or Muslim religious study. Without a ruler to protect them, the Muslim Uyghurs turned to Genghis Khan to overthrow their oppressor. Although the Mongol army was thousands of miles away, Genghis Khan sent 20,000 soldiers under the command of one of his generals to defend the Muslims. And because they were engaging in this campaign at the request of their allies, this time they did not raid or loot the capital city, but instead simply defeated the army, beheaded Kuchluk, and returned home, Ooh. leaving behind a herald to proclaim the restoration of religious freedom in the land. Most importantly to Genghis Khan, this victory ensured complete control over the Silk Road between the Chinese and the Muslims. Although he didn't control the Sung Dynasty, where silk was produced, or the primary purchasing areas in the Middle East. That is so cool, how, how the creation of silk, which was like so uh, like amazing, like, you know, Europeans and everyone wanted it. And nobody knew how it was made, and it was this super big secret, and it was, it was just a bunch of silkworms. And uh, that's crazy. He rerouted the twisting channels of the Silk Road into one large stream over the course of his campaign, and directed it through the Mongol steppes. So much silk passed through his land that the Mongols even started using it as a packing material. Suddenly, life on the steppe looked very different than it had before. Rawhide ropes were exchanged for silk cords. Fur and leather clothes were replaced with robes embroidered in silver and gold. Yurts were decorated with silk rugs, pillows, and blankets. Perfume, makeup, jewelry, board games, paper fans, incense, honey, wine, and board tea games. became commonplace. Skilled artisans, scholars, and entertainers from across Genghis Khan's empire contributed their art, science, and culture to Mongol society. The Muslims in the region, from the mountains of modern Afghanistan to the Black Sea, produced steel, the finest of from the mountains. Khwarazian Empire? Mountains of modern Afghanistan culture to Mongol society. The Muslims in the region, from the mountains of modern Afghanistan to the Black Sea, produced steel, the finest of all metals, as well as cotton and glass. Genghis Khan wanted these novel luxuries also. He sent ambassadors to the Sultan with gifts, approaching not as a conqueror, but as an ally, seeking an equal trade agreement. With great suspicion, the Sultan accepted. Genghis Khan sent hundreds of merchants from his newly acquired territories in caravans laden with goods to trade. As soon as the caravan entered their territory, however, a local official seized the goods and killed the merchants, completely unaware of the incredible mistake he had just made. When Genghis Khan heard of this, he sent envoys to the Sultan asking him to punish the man responsible for the attack. Instead, the Sultan doubled down and killed some of the Mongol envoys, maiming the others and sending them back to the Khan. Genghis- It's crazy how, like, you know how, you know, like the movie 300, like, this is Sparta, boom, down the well. Greatest scene in all of all time cinema. Uh, I, I always thought, like, it was incredibly, like, taboo. For most places to kill an envoy to a messenger you know, don't kill the messenger or whatever but that happens all the time khan was furious so enraged was he by this insult that he withdrew once again to his sacred mountaintop to pray and decide on a course of action After what, what's so great is that like this is a, a like the mongols are like you know not well known you know by like the chinese or the obviously they were they were known but not well known as the power they are becoming and are now and so like he has like he has like whenever he sends people places they they aren't often taken in well because they aren't i guess taken that seriously and seen as a much inferior enemy because they don't know just how much they progressed as an army under temujin under genghis khan 
over the past, you know, de few decades, few years. And so everyone he encounters is just like, eh, whatever. And then they're like, oh, crap. Look at how big and efficient this army is. Three days. And what about the concurved bow? Days of contemplation, he descended with his intention set. Next. Well into his middle age and with a mighty empire under his control, Genghis Khan's thoughts linger on what will happen to that empire after he dies. What will become of his family? What will become of the world he has worked so hard to shape? The 13th century. The Muslim lands of the Khwarezm Empire were the richest and most sophisticated in the world. Its citizens soared above their contemporaries in Europe, India, and China in astronomy, mathematics, agronomy, and many other fields. But because they stood higher, they had the furthest to fall. A hundred thousand Mongol horsemen stormed the Khwarezm cities. The Sultan of Khwarezm had four times as many soldiers, but the Mongol forces were terrifying. And they honored their promise of clemency to all who surrendered as strictly as they honored their promise of destruction to all who resisted. Cities fell one after another. That's kind of why I like... Right here is kind of why I like Genghis Khan a lot. <laughs> um, is that, you know, he's ruthless, but not depending on how you act. And so it gives the, the invadee rather than the invader, like, like, okay, like the reputation of, okay, this army is terrifying, but I know if I surrender, I'm good, you know? And if I don't, I'm, I'm screwed. And so that sort of bit of logic, I guess, that you can depend on would, you know, make it even more probable for people to surrender even more so than just how terrifying you are. ...of destruction to all who resisted. Cities fell one after another. Many surrendered without a fight. Others held out for a few days or weeks before falling. After defeating each city, Genghis Khan sent clerks to divide the civilian population by profession, including doctors, astronomers, judges... Question though, like you know how we noticed the trebuchet that the Chinese had? Um, you know, obviously they have I always saw the great asset, or the great asset. Asset isn't, isn't the greatest word, but I don't want to spend the time looking for a synonym. Or, um, uh, is, is their uh, mobility and their ability to live off the land and, and you know, good structure and them, them on horseback. But in terms of sieging a city with a big wall... Uh, what exactly was their strong point in that, other than just being able to surround and cut off the city? But they seem to be taking over these places really quickly, which assumes, which means that they must have really good siege warfare, and yet he just discovered the trebuchet. And so I'm having a hard time putting that together. Engineers, teachers, artisans, and religious leaders. They especially sought out people who spoke multiple languages. Despite all of their growth, wealth, and power, the Mongols still practiced no crafts themselves other than war, herding, and hunting. All of the skilled work done in their growing empire was done by the people they conquered. They needed teachers as much as they needed riches. But one group in particular could expect no mercy from the Mongol forces, that group being the wealthy and the powerful. Under the chivalrous rules of warfare as practiced in Europe and the Middle East during the Crusades, aristocrats were protected and kept as hostages to be ransomed. The Mongols had no use for such pleasantries. To prevent future wars, they sought out and eliminated any enemy aristocrats they could find. Aristocrats offered nothing of value to the Mongols, and were I'll the most you. likely to resist them successfully in the future. By eliminating the aristocracy, they decapitated the social system of their enemies. As the 1220s rolled in, Genghis Khan was in his 60s, at the height of his power, with nothing and no one standing in his way. But despite his overwhelming success as a conqueror, he was really struggling as a father. Custom held that each son in a herding family inherited some of their family's herd. Genghis Khan intended to instead offer each son a piece of his empire. However, he also needed to choose one son to be the next a piece Khan after he died. He summoned a family Kuraltai to discuss the matter. His two eldest sons, Jochi and Chagatai, were tense and terse with one another. 
Ogade, his third son, arrived to the meeting slightly late and also slightly inebriated. Is he the one that successes Genghis? Genghis Khan asked his eldest son, Jochi, to speak first on the matter of succession. In doing so, he emphasized Jochi's rank as his eldest son, implying he was the likely successor. Chagatai did not agree, and interrupted before Jochi could answer. Jochi lunged at his brother, and the two men started to fist fight. Genghis Khan broke up the fight and tearfully pleaded with his sons, begging them to understand how different things were before they were born when nobody was safe. He ordered them to respect each other, but he knew that he could not impose a choice on them that would last after his death. They would have to find a compromise. After much discussion, the family decided that neither Chagatai nor Jochi should become their father's heir, but instead agreed that the role of successor should go to their mellow, good-natured, and hard-drinking brother, Ogade. Genghis Khan oh, then man. allotted his personal lands and herds to each son and separated Jochi and Chagatai, giving them kingdoms at far opposite ends of his territory. This ordeal cast a pall over the remainder of the campaign. Genghis Khan was now keenly aware of how much work he needed to do to preserve the empire after his death. Let me say something. One of the things, you know, this is the last episode um, of the series. It's been a great series. Uh, but one of the things I was wondering, I'm, I'm like, I know the Mongol Empire goes way beyond this. And so how is it ending so quickly? And then I realize much of it continues through his son and grandson after he dies and then it kind of fizzles out. He had been so dogged in his pursuit of empire and unification that he'd neglected his family. He put much effort into trying to mend the relationship between his eldest sons. He assigned them jointly to a campaign, but neither brother could agree on what tactics to use. And because of their bickering, the campaign stretched on for six months, an unprecedented amount of time for a Mongol siege. Eventually, they had no choice but to burn the city to the ground and flood it, destroying it utterly and leaving nothing to loot. In 1222, the Mongol conquest reached the city of Multan, in modern-day Pakistan. Genghis Khan had set his sights on northern India, the seat of silk production. Here, however, he faced a new enemy that stopped him in his tracks. Hold on. How was silk, the production of silk, kept such a secret for so long if it happened in China and in India? And you're telling me that not one person who had, who knew at least the basics, yeah, it has to do with silkworms, ever let that secret out to, like, European traders or, or something? Uh, how did they keep that a, a secret for so long? Yeah, if you could answer that question. How did they kept, keep silk production such a secret from Europeans and, and other people? Especially since... It wasn't that localized. Uh, India, China. As soon as the Mongols left the dry and cold mountainous regions, both warriors and horses grew sick and weak. The Mongol bows, which were so well adapted to the extreme cold and heat of the steppe, weakened in the damp air and lost their accuracy. The Mongols were forced to fall back and sustained massive casualties as they withdrew to the more familiar climate of Afghanistan. Despite this setback, they had succeeded in their goal of conquering the Khwarezm Empire, bringing Central Asia and- That's crazy how a damper climate just completely nulled their, their bow. And much of the Middle East under Mongol control. To celebrate, Genghis Khan called for a fate that ended up being the largest hunt in history. His men cordoned off a massive area of territory, and tens of thousands of soldiers from different armies converged on the field from different directions. The hunt lasted for months, and was intended as more than a celebration. Genghis Khan also wanted to use it to mellow relations between his sons, and to end the campaign on a cooperative note. Upon returning home, the victorious Mongol army saw the fruits of their conquest. The nation had been utterly transformed. Girls who had spent their days milking goats and yaks were now wearing silk while their new servants performed menial labor for them. Elders who had never seen metal in their lives now cut meat with Damascus steel girded with ivory hilts. They served yaks milk from silver bowls while their musicians sang to them. 
But Genghis Khan was not built for this life. He didn't want to stop conquering, or maybe he couldn't stop conquering. He set out once again to campaign against the Tangut, the very first foreign nation he had conquered after his election as Great Khan. Goddamn Mongolian! You break down my city wall last time! The Tangut had refused to offer troops for the Khwarezm invasion, a slight that could not stand. And establishing a base in the Tangut kingdom would offer a second chance at the Sung dynasty, a target he still coveted. And that is where Genghis Khan's story very suddenly and very mysteriously ends. What happened next remains something of a mystery. Some say that while traversing the Gobi to fight the Tangut, Genghis Khan stopped to catch some wild horses and was thrown from his mount, sustaining internal injuries. Some legends say that he was assassinated by a sex worker, struck by lightning, poisoned, or killed by a magic spell cast by the Tangut king. That one. Heck, Marco Polo even reports in his book chronicling his time in the court of- When was Marco Polo traveling? Seventy one and ninety five, is that so he was there the exact time? Of Kublai Khan, uh, Genghis Khan's grandson, oh. that the great Khan was killed after taking an arrow to the knee. All that we know for sure is that his book chronicling his time in the court of Kublai Khan, uh, Genghis Khan's grandson, that the great Khan was killed after taking an arrow to the knee. All that we know for sure is that just before the Mongol victory over the Tangut, Genghis Khan died quietly. A procession would have set out towards Mongolia with Genghis Khan's body on a simple cart. Isn't it still a mystery where his body is? His horsehair spirit banner would have led the way, and behind the procession would have followed his horse with a loose bridle and an empty saddle. He was buried anonymously in the soil of his homeland, without a monument to mark his grave. Genghis Khan transformed Mongol warfare from a messy tribal raiding system into an intercontinental affair fought on multiple fronts across thousands of miles. His battlefield techniques made the heavily armored knights of medieval Europe obs- I'm giving him a salute, okay? I'm giving him a salute. I've given many other people who have done- Genghis Khan kind of has this, you know, thing of, you know, whoa, he's brutal and like- he was brutal, but so were a lot of other people I've learned about, and I've given them salutes. Elite, replacing them with disciplined cavalry moving in organized units. He made brilliant use of speed and surprise on the battlefield, and perfected siege warfare to such a degree that he ended the era of walled cities. He taught his people to fight not only across incredible distances, but to sustain their campaigns over years, decades, and eventually over three generations of constant fighting. His last ruling descendant remained in power in Uzbekistan until he was deposed by the rising tide of the Soviet Revolution in 1920. Wow. Genghis Khan was also brutal. His goals were achieved through the deaths of millions. The Mongols made no technological breakthroughs, founded no new religions, wrote no great books or dramas, and offered the world no new crafts or methods of agriculture. They simply conquered and assimilated and their tactics left parts of the world depopulated to this day. But the Mongols absolutely did change the world, and that was what young Temujin had desperately wanted from the very moment he first learned how harsh, violent, and unforgiving life could be. He eradicated torture, kidnapping, and raiding from his world, but at the cost of countless lives and entire cultures. Is peace bought with blood and maintained with force truly peace? It may be impossible to say whether Genghis Khan left the world better than he found it, but it was still undeniably changed. I think he, lo I think he left Mongolia better. No, I didn't. What, what is this? I think he left well Mongolia into better his than middle age when he found and with it. A mic um, awesome. Awesome Blossom, extra awesome. Okay. Um, great series once again from uh, Extra Credits here. I'd like to learn a bit about Ancient Greece, and I think that's what I'm going to next. Also, the Seven Years' War. But uh, I think understanding Ancient Greece, as I've understand, uh, understood Rome a bit and Alexander the Great, um, just to secure my foundation on Western civilization before I go and uh, fill in the gaps uh, later on.
Hope you're all doing well. Hope you learned something or can teach me something in the comments or, you know, join the Discord. Love to have you. Hope you're doing well. If not, chin up. You'll be good soon. See you guys next time. Bye.